So, what I've been doing is I've been setting up environments where I set up schema migrations. Okay, who who's familiar with schema migrations? All right. So, quick little run through of schema migrations. The idea is that you have a way to bring up your data schema within your system, whatever it is. Maybe it's Apache Cassandra or Postgres or MySQL or Mongo or whatever it is. And you have a way you can just tear it down and then bring it back without any worry about it, right? And it builds the schema in the database. So it's not like a migration of data. That's just what a migration is, right? It's a schema migration. So build it up, destroy it, and put it right back. The great thing about this is, let's say you have five developers right now. And then next week you have 40 developers for some crazy reason. And you need all of them to have that schema. A great way to do this is to have schema migrations. Then you can just say, run the migrations. Boom. It spins up that schema environment for them, right? So combine that with, say, Docker, and you have an environment that can get spooled up in like five seconds, right? And they can have an entire schema of the system. So I'm going to show you how I've been doing that a little bit lately. Uh, with mostly with good luck, it's succeeding. And there's been a little qualms like I've actually had to start looking into writing a, a, a bit of code for some of the things. So, oops, I didn't want that. I'm actually going to, I apologize, connect to the internet because I didn't do that on this machine. Who uses Linux? Secure password, right? <laughs> I wrote secret password. And I, uh, that's my other password. All right, there we go. Cool. Um, are we really connecting? The question mark stays there for a few minutes. All right, everybody can definitely like see all these pieces, right? Let me try to. Mark time. All right, so one of the tools that I've been using to do this, there's, there's two main tools. One is JetBrains Data Grid. Who uses a JetBrains product? Okay, who's, who's used Data Grid? Anybody? Okay, two hands. So basically, Data Grid is a very data focused IDE around SQL. Okay, or SQL-like dialects. Um, almost, well actually, I don't know what percentage, but a large percentage of the capabilities of DataGrip are available in the other IntelliJ products. You just have to get the right plugins and everything and get connected to the databases, blah, 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 and write the SQL in those two. But DataGrip is focused mostly around just writing the CQL or the SQL or whatever it is that you're trying to write against the database. So what I have been doing is using it combined with Few other plugins and go go migrate go lang migrate I think is what it's called the library this library is pretty freaking awesome so it's a pretty standard CLI to do migrations with it'll come up anyway it supports Postgres, MySQL. Uh, let's, actually, let's do this. It supports a ton of stuff. The only two that I've had a little bit of iffiness with is it doesn't have MS SQL support yet, but like there's a driver, and you can basically take some of the other existing stuff and port it pretty easily. No one's just done it yet. The other thing that I had to do a local build myself for is to get the CQL for Apache Cassandra to work, but it works. That's the important thing. Um, and I have a PR that's supposed to go in that's going to fix the Cassandra thing. Because all it is is a, it's an off issue with the SSL or something. It's, it's looking for some something that's associated to some other type of connection. So anyway, it's still not coming up. I'll show you the little bit I have here set up. So what I've been doing is I break out in a data database migrations folder, like one does for migrations, 
I have one for my Cassandra here and then one for my Postgres. And accordingly, what the Golang migrate does is it looks for blah file based on date time here and then the dot up or dot down. What it does is it puts all the ups in sequence and executes them when it finds those. And if you say go down, it executes all the downs in sequence according to the date stamps and brings the system down safely, right? Or the schema, the schema down. Um, and the same thing for CQL and Cassandra. One has to note though, with Cassandra being a distributed system, if you write out your key spaces or whatnot for various replication or whatever, and your query is a certain way for one environment, like your dev environment that has, say, 10 nodes, and your production environment has 900 nodes, you got to make sure to do like a transformation on CQL to run appropriately in production versus not in production. Versus like with Postgres, it's just it's the server, right? You know, you just run the schema and it's on the server. So I have those. And then what I've done for my development environments is I've set up a pretty straightforward Docker setup where I set up a network and I put everything in my network. The reason I do that is I can set the IP statically so that I can get reference in my readme or other things and anybody else can run it and it just sets up that network and does the same side arrange for them, right? Here I have my subnet side of range, my gateway, uh, IPPG is for Postgres, IP is just for the, the single year, singular Cassandra node that I have. The other advantage of this is if I have a distributed system like Cassandra, or say you're doing Kafka or something like that, then you can pick five or six IPs or however many nodes you want to run, depending on your machine, and spool up that many nodes in your network, your Docker network, and then run that as if it were your ecosystem on your machine. So I do that, and let's see if I can actually get this to run. Okay, so basically what I have done, you see how I've named it, this down, step up. I've set up my little micro database universe to do the schema migrations in, the same way I've set up the schema migrations, except it's the containers for the infrastructure, right, for the server infrastructure. And stuff. So if I do dev up, it just builds the network, and I have it print out a bunch of information so I can see when it gives the IP address, make sure nothing weird has happened. Um, and then I get it to create, for Postgres, I get it to create an initial database. Because in schema migrations, there is the assumption that your database is there. You're just doing a buff, the schema up and then the schema down, right? Um, in Cassandra, it's a little different because your, your key space, even though it kind of exists in that how do you, database slash schema type of paradigm, it, uh, it can be created and destroyed as part of your schema migration, right? So I have both of those up now. Sandra 3114, Postgres 11.2. I'm going to bump this up to 4 soon. I just got to work like earlier today, but I, I broke my Mac. I, my tears have not been crying on it. Uh, and then if I run up, up actually has my run the migration in it, that command. And the reason I wrote a shell script is just because I'm going to do more than one migration, right? I want to do Postgres migration, it has Cassandra migration, and then whatever else I might have. Like if I have, uh, what is it in Kafka? Drum, like the, you, yeah, you scrap the topics or whatever. Like if you want to set up some of those things, you could technically do a migration on that too. So to do all of them, I just put them in a script and run it. Boom. So now I have my three tables in there. All right. So now that we have a little place in there, I'm just going to show you a few little things about data grip, just because it's kind of cool. So this is this is Go Go Land, the JetBrains IDE for Go. So here's my massive Go application, just so that I I actually have it in Go Land running, and it ran the migration. Now the cool thing with Data Grip, open that up. Wow, it's huge. Oh, I should. 
should probably turn my microphone magnification down. Maybe I can get this right here. Well, this machine doesn't get any bigger than I guess. That's another advantage of having all your stuff as containers. You spill, spin up your entire world on this thing instead of the, using the internet. All right, so here, here's Datagrip. And I have a few plugins that I highly suggest that you get when using Datagrip. One is the Files and Folder plugin. So basically, you can look at files and folder as you would any tree of files and folders, right? So I can go and open, and it has all the pertinent little bits for that. Let's see, here we go. Source, GitHub, me. There's my stuff. Consist, migration. That, that was a weird feature. Oh, and it put files on the other side. But anyway, you can see it makes it look a little bit more like the other IDEs. Because one thing about DataGrip is it kind of has this notion of like you're just opening consoles and working against something. You're not particularly saving a bunch of files. But I usually have my stuff saved in a repo, so I want to be able to you know, play, mess around with the files and stuff. So anyway, that's, that's there. I opened up that project. And then... The other thing, this is the part that's familiar with all the other, or similar to all the other IDEs, is the database part where you can go in and you connect to whichever database, like let's say Apache Cassandra. And, I mean, that's, that's a pretty standard looking thing. Uh, since I'm a little flaked out on the internet here, I'm not going to download the driver. But any one of these things, you just click download driver, and it's just there. You don't even have to restart like most of the other plugins we did, right? Um, you get connected, then you can write queries all day long against it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is basically what I wanted to show you. So that's that's the start of my multi-part survey of tools. This is DataGrip, GoLand, and we'll get a little bit more into that based on schema migrations and getting your data environment built out in an easy, easy way. So thank you. Any questions? That is a good question. It's mostly a black box to me so far. But, but what I have done, state. it does. What it, what it does, it appears to be doing, is it creates a, another table in the database that you're migrating. Um, I haven't paid much attention to exactly what it's writing in the table, but I know it's like it's bouncing in a new record every time you additively create new things or if you tear it down. So like it, it at least has one record that says, you brought everything up, or you brought everything down. Um, and if it gets in a weird state, you just have to delete the record and then <laughs> start over again. But like I said, I, I haven't really noticed exactly what it's writing there. But I'm assuming it's just writing the, it ran the thing. Yeah, so, uh, and it's not, are you familiar with the flyway or things like that? I am a little bit, I haven't used it in ages. So it sounds like go, go lane library is maybe not so fundamentally different from something like flyway. It, that was the influence, as a matter of fact. It's in the README somewhere in there. Uh, Flyway and about a lot of the other migration tools. Uh, a couple people just wanted it in Go. So they started writing in, in Go, and then a bunch of other people piled on and were like, oh, I want it for this database and that database. And the next thing they knew, they had like 20 databases or something supported. So it, it blew up on it pretty quick. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from the job in Scholarbooks. So mm -hmm. I use Flyway and extended it with the synergy and the Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. It totally is. Uh, they weren't trying to break new ground. They just wanted to go to go their other go stuff. That was really how it was. So, any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, filming migrate. Are you able to assess current state and differentiate or order different between the previous migration and the current state? So. It does do some. Yeah. I haven't run through enough, because I've been going through kind of trial and error, trying to figure out exactly what it does when the state's kind of flaked out. Uh, like, if it's run, and it's built out the state, and then you go in and you're like, I, I'm changing the table. <laughs> then the next run says, oh, something's out of, out of configuration, or whatever it says, out of state. It doesn't know what happened. So it stops, and you have to take some action to fix that. Anything else? Curious. Uh, uh, is, 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 is it Datagrip? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, David. Right. Is it is it kind of like Navicad or Table Plus, or is it like is there some killer features that makes it? Because it's this is kind of a non familiar interface or database work for me. Yeah, I I kind of feel the same way. Okay. Um, it's I feel like it's very console focused. Like in the MDI here, the multi document interface part, the things that open up there are all consoles. Now, when you start going through it though, and you're, you're just, you can tell it to say, uh, generate me CQL or SQL for create a key space or a table or do this referential integrity constraint or something like that. Um, and it just spits it out in a console. So it just gives you the code and you can run it or whatever. Uh, but it's very focused around it, and it feels like it's basically a really powerful console with some little UI elements attached so you can more easily just visualize things around it. And it'll do some things too, like uh, generate a, a diagram or something like that. So there's some other plugins there that are pretty cool about that. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Sweet. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Illustration of the past 10 years cloud computing evolution. So we start from, I mean, 2005, 2006 in Cape Town, somewhere in Cape Town. Some AWS guys think that we can, they can build uh, some VMs and then can sell them. Uh, that started in 2000, maybe six, some five maybe, something like that. And then after a while, 10 years later, that EC2 is wildly successful, wildly successful. It's, uh, I don't know how many, Amazon just reported its quarterly, quarterly result, I think. AWS is 25 billion quarterly revenue, something like that. So it's, it's, it's a B, a billion, right? So it's widely successful. But going forward like 10 years, maybe not 10 years, Docker comes out at, uh, came at 2013, something like that. Right, then containers suddenly caught up. Everybody's talking about Docker, Docker images, Docker hub, everything, right? So, now we get to the containers. And uh, when we talk about containers, we have to talk about Kubernetes, right? In the last two years, Kubernetes pretty much has won this container orchestration war. This, this is done, Kubernetes, right? So containers has, so evolving to Kubernetes. But in the same time, there's another one coming, it's called serverless, which means there's, the users doesn't even have to worry about anything about servers. One thing I, I have want to just, at least from my standpoint, containers are not serverless. 
it's just a lightweight VM. You, you, you get a VM, you get a container. It's faster, but it's still a resource you have to maintain. So that's not really serverless, but it's a little bit debatable. Some, some domain, some it, people want to say this is also serverless, but we can, we can debate after this. And on the, on the right side, we can see the, the difference between IS is pass and fast. Right? The, the IS is basically you get a VM, and uh, you, have, you can do whatever you want to do. But you have to do all these things. Otherwise, it's just a bare machine. There's an empty VM. You, there's nothing you, you can do with it. So on the left side, for IS, the cloud provider, all, the, all they need to do is just, when you ask for a VM, they give you a VM. You have to do a lot more. Right? When you go to a pass, you, they have to do a little bit more. That The cloud provider has to do a little bit more. And the, the, the pass is the one that, uh, like the app engine. Like Google, Google started with app engine 10 years ago. Right? They have this idea that instead of giving you a machine, I give you some services that you can do it. You don't have to do from the bare minimum. So that's passed. Three years ago, 2015, right? Yeah, so it's three years ago, we come out the serverless Lambda. That's the serverless side. That it's basically, you don't have to do anything. You have your code, and we'll, the cloud providers will do everything for you. So you can see that. You, get, you move to the right side or move to the, the x, x axis and y axis. If you're going further, it's getting more. So the, u, the user, does, this is the percentage of time spent on your app logic means you don't have to worry about anything else. You just worry about your own app logics. So that's the basic idea. Just so here, here's the timeline, right? 2014 is when, 2014, I think it's November, uh, August or November, AWS Lambda first launched. That's the first serverless, so-called, really the word serverless comes out of a major cloud provider. It's way ahead of its competitors. Azure and the Google Functions came out at 2016. Google, actually, it's, it's Google's way. They came out in beta in 2016, but they didn't go GA, general availability, until 2018. So it took them a, one year and a half from beta to go to GA. And here's us, I have a cloud function. Uh, function function compute. We we went beta in 2017. Uh, April, function function. And then we didn't we didn't do the Google. We like wait for a year and a half. We waited for like six months, and we went GA in, in the same year in October. Finally, here here's the interesting thing is 2018. I don't know I don't know if any of you have heard of this this thing K Native. So on the left side, those are all hosted serverless, which in my opinion is the real serverless. That as a user, you don't have to do anything. You upload your, your function, or you write your function, upload or do something, then everything else is taken care of by the cloud provider. Knative is on the contrary, you, you're kind of both the and all the things that I'm going to spend a large amount of my talk into. It may get a little bit boring, but just I'll get, let you know how hard it is to, it sounds really good, but it, it's very hard. Any questions? Any questions so far? Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Let me know. Okay. So how, okay, finally, uh, what is serverless computing? All right. What is serverless computing? Here, here's what I, I think is the, really the um, core features of serverless computing. Right. There are many different flavors. As I mentioned, Google has its own flavor, Azure, uh, AWS, Lambda, and, and us, and, and the many, many others. Oracle has one. Pretty much everybody, actually everybody has, has one. Um, IBM has one, Oracle has one. Who else doesn't have one? Everyone has one. But th that's kind of the, the, what's that, the, the, what's that called? It's the least dominant? Anyway, the common ground of this, all these features, right? So first thing is serverless. It's really less. There's a space in it. Less, there's, there's no server. You shouldn't have any server. Second thing is event driven. Event driven is very important. It's not just you call a server, it's you, you, you use the HTTP endpoint or you invoke it. The event driven is the ecosystem. I will show that later. You can have all kinds of different cloud events triggering that function to run. That's kind of the, the killer app for. And third thing is auto scaling, which means there's a, I'll mention, I'll, I'll touch upon that later too, but uh, just quickly, previously in the, in the past world, the auto scale mostly means the user 
would set up a formula in most of them. We'll say, if the CPU is over 90%, please scale up to blah, 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 or, or, or other things. The, the, that is truly auto-scale. This one, the serverless is truly auto-scale that you have no control. On the good side, you don't have to say any formula. On the bad side, you have no control. All you need to do, all you can do is just say, here's my function, I'm going to use it. How does the platform scale it is beyond, is out of the user's control. It could be good or could be bad, but in the traditional, the, all these hosted serverless platforms, it's really automatic, really automatic. The fourth thing is pay as you go. That's the biggest difference between serverless and non-serverless is non-serverless non is basically we are buying resources, right? VMs, it, it, that burden, that's remember the previous graph, the cloud infrastructure, the burden is really high. Why? Because even if you don't use it, they have to pay it, but you don't have to. So it put a lot of pressure on the cloud provider to, to make resource utilization really good. They will have to have many good resource utilization algorithms. So these are the four, I, I, I think that's the four key features of serverless computing. Again, any questions? Any questions from the Twitch group? Is it dropping to one or two? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So why serverless computing? Why do people like it? it, it I, I, don't, I think most people know that AWS Lambda, right? AWS Lambda really caught off. It's, uh, it's again, a, a, I don't know, multi-million dollar, multi-hundred million dollar business in a few years. The reason is just easy to use. See, he, just like this. You write some function like that. I hope I can have a pointer. But you just write some function like that, use a function. The only difference between right, you have a main function, some kind of main function. This thing is, you have an interface. It's not called main, it's called something else. So you have this specific interface. You upload it to AWS Lambda or any other cloud providers and tell them, this is the function entry point of all my program. And voila, that's it. Nothing else. You upload all your dependencies. Then everything to the right side is the, is the platform's responsibility. They are going to do the auto scale, the container. And most of them do some sort of containerization. I know AWS doesn't do Docker. They didn't do Docker. M others may most likely do, do some kind of Docker containerization. And then do the auto scale. So you, if you want to use this function, if the function we call it invoke, or you, you can call it let's like run. If you want function to run, you invoke it or use events to trigger it, it will run. You don't have to worry about that. Only thing is you have to worry about paying for it. When it runs too well, sometimes it's called denial of wallet that you run out of your credit card maximum. That's, that's the only thing you have to worry about. So sounds pretty intriguing, right? Like that's why people like it. And especially if like AWS make it really good work very well, then people really like to use it. Right? So that's part of the reason I think it's caught off. Another thing is here's a study by Google. I don't remember exactly where I steal this thing from. Thanks, Google. Um, uh, give the credit when the credit is due. Uh, it, they did some research on them, their own platforms. Right? There's Compute Engine, which is the VM-based, the IIS-based. Kubernetes Engine is the Kubernetes, the basically it's their container orchestration. It's the IIS on the container side. I think of this way. Instead of VMs, it's the IIS on the container side. And the App Engine is, the, is, is their traditional pass. And the cloud functions is their serverless platform. So you can see that the, the graph basically says on the left side is the more configurability means you can tweak. Some, some people like to tweak their, their clusters. There are, there are gazillion ways you can tweak your uh, VMs. You can do anything. You can find, you can, there are, I don't know, maybe 100 different types of VMs. And you can do, do the configuration of um, or the networks, all these things. On the right side, the agility is basically means like the cloud function is the serverless one, right? That you basically cannot do anything. There's not much you can configure, but it's agility. It runs really fast. The, 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 uh, all these words are pretty too small to read, but it's kind of an idea. And uh, the interesting thing, they did also did a study. I think they have a pretty good user research groups. They invite people to come and give them a Hello World app to, to build. Guess what? The Kubernetes engine is supposed to be pretty, pretty fun. Um, took them six hours to build the first Hello World app. While the Cloud Functions is 15 minutes. You write your Cloud, you write your Hello World, upload it, voila, 15 minutes, it starts to run. So 
So that's the vast difference between serverless and uh, in the traditional ISs. So Kubernetes, as I mentioned, Kubernetes and Compute Engine, both ISs, is just one is on VMs, one is on containers, sort of. And the uh, App Engine is the pass in between. So just. What's the basis of these Hello World programs they have designed? Because they have to set up all the settings. You have to get a Kubernetes cluster, make it to run, set up your pod, set up your network, security entry, security uh, groups. That's not a Hello World program, though. That's infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. So to get this Hello World to work, you have to spend so, ma so many hours on the infrastructure. Oh, yeah, so you, you have to, how do we have to run something, run, run on something, right? Yeah. So if you choose a Kubernetes engine to run on, you have to set up that up. Yeah. If you just choose serverless cloud function, you have, don't have to set up anything. So it's just Hello World. That's why it takes only 50, exactly. So uh, Adrian, right, yep. uh, have a really good observation that, which means for all these six hours, only 15 minutes is spending writing that Hello World function, because that, that's yeah. pretty much nothing. It never takes the, six hours the, the, the rest is, is trying to figure out all these Kubernetes. If any of you have ever read Kubernetes APIs, I can't. It's, <laughs> it's just so confusing. I, the, 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 it's hard to, it's not, at least my mind doesn't fit into that. Even VM may be okay, but Kubernetes, all these APIs is just, yeah, mind blowing for me. I, um, yeah, six hours, I might need to do 12 hours to get it work. Uh, the quality of the documentation. Yeah, yeah, and, and that. <laughs> Right, so that, that's a really good point. Okay, so, so sounds, sounds great, right? Serverless, sounds great. Uh, now I'm going back to the K-native. That's the first, uh, I think Adrian also mentioned that in the past 10 years, it's the cloud computing is mostly proprietary. So Google, Google function, Azure function, AWS Lambda, I cannot see any of their source code. I can see this one's source code. This is an open source project, Knative. You can download, it's on GitHub, you can try to set it up and uh, make it work. So it claims, it first thing is it's open source framework. And uh, it runs, it basically runs the serverless application on Kubernetes. So it takes care of all these setups for you, right? Instead of set up Kubernetes, it will do a lot of setups for you. So you can build up relatively easily to, you can start a Kubernetes server and then they will do the um, setups for you. And what are the, the in real, very, very high level, it just has three different components. One is called build, which means when you upload your function or your code, like, like 100, 200 lines of code, it will build a con Docker container for you. That's the build part. So you don't have to write your Docker file and the set up things, upload to some hub and then download it. They will do this for you, so the build part. Serving, serving is they will set up the Kubernetes cluster, set up all the routings, who is going to where, securities, and uh, auto scale policies. Very basic, that's what I want to mention. Very, very basic auto scale policies, and they'll make it work. And third one is eventing. As I mentioned, I don't know if you remember, event driven is the key part of serverless. So they also need to set up the event that can get hooked up with different type of event sources. So these are basically three things. So it, it has, I didn't really play with it, but it looks like if you download it, you set it up, maybe I'm not super smart. You may be smarter than me. Maybe in an hour or also, you can set it work mostly, right, like that. It may, took me a, may take me a two hours. I'm not good at setting up things. But that's the basic idea. So Google claims that now you can have your serverless. You can have your serverless. You don't have to always go to AWS Lambda to have your serverless. You can have your own serverless. But really, that, that's, that's pretty much my, the bulk of my talk is, is really. So, um, yes? Can you just basically like just set up your own uh, cloud functions, like on your own servers or something? Yeah, you can, you can, you probably, I don't know how many machines does it need. I don't know if it can be set up just on your laptop or you kind of need a little bit strong, bigger machines, get some VMs, and then set it up. And, but it doesn't need many machines. One or two should be, should be good enough. You can set it up and you can play with it. And you can have your first serverless experience, full control. You can even know where, where your function goes. You can kind of peek behind the curtain to see what, what happens there. So that, that, that's actually pretty cool. It's, and it's, uh, it's a very uh, promising uh, project out there. 
Anybody interested can try it. Any any questions? Any other questions? Can you look at OpenFast or OpenFast? OpenFast was before Knative, but when the Knative comes out, it kind of just yeah, it's kind of just the it becomes kind of the yeah serverless framework for the because Kubernetes, Istio, Envy, all these CNCF guys come out. It's kind of it has its royal blood with it, so <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's high bomb basically. Anybody is, yeah, it's, it's definitely high bomb. It's yeah. So if you're interested, in that that's the one to to go. Yeah. Yes. I think. Again, definitely just my personal opinion. I think that's the Google's, or at least the CNCF's uh, intention, so that after maybe 10 years, or 10 years later, everything runs on Knative can run on all three or whatever four different cloud providers, that it becomes a standard that everybody will support, that you can, if things run on Knative, it will run on AWS Lambda. But whether that can happen, it's definitely, I have no idea. Lambda function on Knative. Yeah, I think so, yeah. No, we don't. That, that's actually what we, I'm going to get into. All these frameworks looking very good, um, but when you hit the scale, it's scalability, right? When you hit the scale, none of them works. I've never seen any those type of open source easy ones would work. It, it, would, it would, not, would not work. And basically, my next 20 minutes is going to tell you why it, it won't work. That's, 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 yeah. Okay, so, yeah, you know, I put a lot of pictures behind that. The reason is I think that all these bullet points are kind of really boring. So just, if you're zoning out, just look at these pictures. Those are all taken, <laughs> those are all taken within two hours of Seattle, or, yeah. That looks like my backyard. Yeah, oh. yeah, to, in last year, right? Um, this year, this year. February, the, the Snowmageddon, right? That's oh your yeah. backyard, yeah. 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 Well, what type of bugs did they get? What type of what? What type of bugs did they get? Bites? Bugs. Oh, oh. okay, so no, you, you're, you're kind of ahead of me. So now let's talk about bugs. So, hi, so if you want to build a scalability, you build a serverless platform that scale. Right? First, uh, first, let me throw out a number here. So the, cloud, uh, the Alibaba Cloud Function, our platform, is handling several billion requests per day. So if you at least hit that scale, I'm talking about at that scale, several billion requests per day scale. Millions, 10 millions, probably you won't hit any of these. When you hit billions, 10 billions a day, those are the, those are the problems we get when we hit to that scale. So just give you an idea what kind of scale we are, we are talking about. So bugs, um, and bugs is kind of related to, first thing, I assume any, most of you write, still write code or has written code before, right? Raise your hand if you have never written any bugs. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So just it, it, just, it just happens, right? It just happens. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry? <laughs> How many features? <laughs> oh, features, yeah. I, I write more features than my bugs. I, I think that that's I can be proud of. <laughs> Hopefully I just keep one bug per feature. That, that's good enough. Uh, right, so yeah, high, av high availability basically means you have to be, your server has to be up all the time, all the time. With, with a billion requests, not a billion, multi-billion requests coming every day, it has to be up all the time. The first thing is really bugs. I, I think I've been to many, I've, I've worked at many uh, cloud providers or, or server sites. I think maybe 50, 50, maybe more than 50% of the incidents, we call it incident, everywhere it's called a little bit different, incident means some, something wrong. The root cause is some kind of bug, right? It's still someone writes some bug. So, yeah. Why does that bug only manifest at scale? Why wouldn't it manifest at other scale? Oh, oh uh, that, that's a very good question. So there are different type of bugs, right? There are bugs that you can easily identify if you run it once, goes down. That's a that's easy bug, right? There are other bugs that if you run it thousands of times, the concurrent bugs. It will bound to happen. Those are type of bugs. But actually, even more. 
the other bugs, when I call it a bugs, it's kind of generalization. It's things will not, everything will work. Actually, if you look at, uh, if you ever get to see some of the postmortems, the public postmortems from the cloud companies, some of the bugs are like this. Only if A happened, B happened, and C is down, happened to be D is also down, it triggers this thing. Those are the bugs I'm talking about. Like, of course, sometimes I write a divided by zero of these, but those are relatively easy to figure out. To basically, you just have to write many, many, many test cases. Like I, like I spent last two weeks writing test cases, just like that. If you want a high quality code, the easiest thing, the least you can do is write at least three times more test code. If you don't write that, I wouldn't feel com comfortable putting the code into the server at least three times more code of test code than server code. But that's the least you can do. Um, after that, those, are, those basically will, will, will iron out all these easy bugs, like you run it, it will die, hit this branch, if else, boom, die. Those are easy ones. Concurrent ones, that's, that's, that's those three types more test comes into play. You have to find all type of concurrent ways to hit this. Right? The last bug is the most difficult part bug that you have A down, B happen to be down or not really down. You still, still serve one or two requests comes through and the rest doesn't come through. Those are the nasty ones. So th those are the bugs I'm talking about. But that kind of oh, that, that kind of touch all these other bases, right? Unreliable infrastructure. What does that mean is your, your server will down. You're running on three servers and the two of them are down. Right? You have to be prepared. Or the whole we call in, uh, availability zone can go down. Things, things happen. Right? How, how, how do you make sure that your server is still up? Right? Knative can do that? Maybe. I, I don't know. That's, I don't know if they've thought about that. Dependent services. If you build a, any, if, if any of you worked in uh, any of the cloud providers, they have so many fundamental services security services, RAM services, um, queues, tables, uh, S3, all these services, they all can be hiccups. How do you make sure your service is up when any of them are having problems? And they will, again, again guaranteed, right? Component upgrade. So even, even if everybody is rock solid, everything is solid and everything works, you still have to upgrade your component. You have new releases. You, it's not avoidable, right? It's not avoidable. You have to release it. You have new features. You have to release it. The way to release one is to you have to bring down a server and bring the new binary up. That is a downtime by design, right? You cannot run your server just 24-7 uh, and don't, don't turn, turn it down. You have to upgrade it. How do you make sure that during your upgrade, it's still up, right? By the way, I'm not going to give you any, all the answers because I don't have all the answers. I can probably, if I do, I will write that book like this. There's so many, so many things. I'm just giving you some ideas why it's so hard. At the end, again, you'll get bored because it feels like just hard. So now you can look at these pictures. I pick different pictures. <laughs> and try to, if you can figure out all where these pictures, location of these pictures, there's a reward. Okay. Fourth one is also a very tricky one is throttling users. Users, they are unpredictable. Sometimes they write bugs, everybody write bugs. They will just hit you like at w at when you are least expected. And, but as a platform, you have millions of users, if, if not more than that. So how do you throttle this one and not affecting the other? Right? That, that's, think about that, all these questions. If you ever get to design something, think about all these questions. See if, if, you, if you're platform can pass all these. F finally, th this is not a, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just whatever I come up in mind in the, this afternoon, right? Protecting downstream services. Sometimes everything works well. Your server is humming, humming along, but you're generating too many traffics for your downstream services. They cannot handle it. You may write the rock solid code, but and, and, and the architect you have all the fault tolerance, redundancy, scale out. But your down services, your, for example, your, your database, your queue, your other uh, identity services. Identity services is another thing. 
is a really, really tricky thing. You may not think about that a lot, but you have to authenticate every request. Uh, all these things. If they are not, they are more like a single point failure, or they are not, they are not that reliable, not as rock solid as yours. Your system goes down with it, and uh, from the user standpoint, they don't know what happens. They only know that your server is down, so your ha your availability drops. Right. If you are not scared of all the terrible thoughts, I already gave you there more. And scale serverless is hard. Um, performance, right? You, Performance and scalability is kind of go hand in hand, and if you want to have high performance, you have to go more scale. Right? And the first thing com many people complain, even AWS Lambda, many many people complain about their code start. What does code start mean? It means because remember they will, the, it's kind of hand to hand with the third one, elasticity. So most pl platforms, service platforms, as I mentioned, the platform bear the cost. So even if there's no traffic going through their service platform, they still pay for the resources. So if they want to save their money, they want to re elastic, they basically want to scale down to zero when you don't have a traffic. That save their money, like save the platform's money. But that brings to pretty much the kind of the, the, the same nature of the services. Then there's a point of the first request comes, there's no resources. There's always a bootstrap time for the first resource to come up. That's the cold start time. There are many, many ways to do it, to, to reduce it, but uh, even AWS hasn't really figured that out, how to reduce that too. Because some of our, like I can only speak for our customers, some of our customers are really uh, latency sensitive. They want every request to be answered within 10 milliseconds, which is not doable if you don't have anything. You need to download their code, build a container, bring it up and start to serve the request. It's not doable within 10 milliseconds. Right. That's a cold start. And then there's scalability, like really scalability. You only hit one, and then boom, that spike. Right. How do you bring up so many containers within a minute? How many containers you can bring in with a minute? Like not, not that many. Right. That's also the elasticity is the thing. When do you actually bring it down? It's, it's, uh, none of them are easy questions, by, by the way. I'm, uh, that's why I'm not giving any answers. Um, when do you bring it down? Because if you bring it down too, too aggressively, you save your money, you hit this cold start more. If you don't bring it down aggressively, you lose money. You're, you're having your machine sitting there doing nothing. Right? Velocity. Velocity and scalability is kind of, again, hand in hand, is how fast you can scale. How fast you can scale. Right? That, and resource management. So with all these, you, those actually, all these things are, are doable. You can, I can do all of these. If I have unlimited resources, I just bring 10,000 machines standing there to, doing nothing. You come here, I can do that, right? But we, nobody has. The cloud gives you the, the, the image of limited, unlimited resources, but everybody is working with the limited resources. And make it worse. Um, we have limited, limited machines in a certain area. So even like, again, AWS or, or Google, Azure, I've worked in all of them, at least two, three of them, is they have, if you, if you ask them, they can say, I, we have 10 millions of machines sitting somewhere. But if you ask them at a certain point, I want some machines, certain machines at certain data center, then they will say, okay, uh, we run out of that machines. We have, I have machines here, there, 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 but we, we run out of machines at certain, certain data, data centers. So that's the resource management I'm talking about. So we, end, we still need to get machines, and if the, the velocity spike of requests comes in, we can easily run out of machines, really physical machines. What's, and, what's yeah. the cold start in our bundle? What's the cold start time? Yeah. We can hit 200 milliseconds. Right. Yeah. We did a lot of things behind that yeah. to drop it down to 200 milliseconds. And finally, the resource utilization. That's, again, all these are going hand in hand, one way or other. You just cannot get a better of both worlds. That if you leave all these resources sitting idle behind, you have much better code start time, scalability time, but your utilization is down, way down. You are going to pay all the bills, you're going to make, lose money. In bigger cloud providers, they may be able to handle it, but smaller providers will be li very difficult. Does Alibaba only make software or hardware still? Alibaba makes everything. <laughs> it makes you happy, right? 
<laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Main time to response, like the first request or uh, after that? Is that the the warm? You mean the the warm part? If I understand the question correctly, so the question is, if the function is already loaded into a container, the, the resource setup is not, is, is out of the way, how do, we, uh, how do we make the request mean response time faster? Yeah. Mm, we, we just bring good network and our latency, network latency, that basically rely on our network latencies. We don't add many overhead. Our software overhead is very low. We basically, it's just the, the route, the how many, that goes down to, I'm not a network engineer, it's really basically how many hops you, you go through the, uh, these network switches and how fast it goes back. Oh, these are already in memory. Or, or if when, you see when it becomes warm, means they're already in memory. The container is already started and in memory. So yeah, it's definitely within milliseconds. It's, it's a one millisecond round, round trip time. Around, that's, the, that's the number we get. Yeah. Yeah, the rest is what's basically it's how long your function runs. The function run time is dominant time. The, the, it's when you, when you call it, we call it synchronized, basically you request and it comes back. The overhead of the round trip network time and our software layer time is, again, milliseconds. So it depends on how much you, the function itself runs. That's the majority of the response time. We, we can think offline, I can tell you, tell you more. Well, I give you, I'll give you more of uh, our architects, then you can probably understand more of how we can do these things. And yeah, yes? Yeah, we do. No, definitely that's not a reason to upgrade out of serverless. Two things. One thing is uh, I would mention that tooling. So what you mentioned is you, you mentioned that the user may not be aware of that. That's the deficit because the user either is not aware of or there's no good tooling for them to know what's going on there. Second thing is it's just a design principle when you have the Basically, it's the throughput is the minimum of your entire data uh, dependency path, right? If you have a choking point, then your throughput scalability is that choking point. So we, re we would definitely recommend any of our service, our customers that is want to hit scale using serverless storages, serverless 
serverless, we, so I think I said mentioned serverless compute. So there's also serverless storage, serverless queue, serverless everything. So you need to match your function with your serverless backend. Otherwise, as you mentioned, uh, there will be a choking point and your downstream, that's the, we call downstream resource will be overwhelmed and nothing works. Yes, yes. It's basically, in a nutshell, it's a container, some sort of container, some are Docker, some are not. Spin up with the code of the user code and all the dependencies, dependencies and uh, it will run the code there, get results coming back. That's every, all these Knative and all the proprietary uh, serverless platform does the same way. Yes. We, we use container now, but, uh, but we may not use that later. Docker. Currently it's Docker, yes. But that, that I can think of, uh, think with you offline, that probably will not be Docker soon. Correlation between dependency and, and, and security? Um, definitely, I mean, I we would always recommend our, it's kind of not in our, our platform, it's mostly for the recommendation best practice for our users. Sometimes users would use in secure way, then <coughs> they're they are using their dependency in an insecure way. Then there's not much we can do, we only can tell them that's not a good way to use it. Um, I would mention that, but uh, in our, in actually most of the functions that I know of, the Azure function, Google function, your function will get some encrypted tokens to ad for you to authenticate your identity. So some users like to write, not like forget about, they just write their password, secure password into their code. But we will always recommend them to use, we'll, we'll give them in our context, in a, in a runtime environment, there's a context coming with the encrypted authentication for them, authentication token for them to use. That's one of the one of the uh, problems or the uh, <coughs> kind of newbie newbie mistakes many of our customers use make. We always mention, remind them, remember to use that, not to use your whatever password. That's how. That's at least one way to solve the security dependency thing. And if you have more questions, we can think of like on that side. Okay. Yeah, because next thing is security, right? <coughs> First thing, definitely there's authentications. It's actually a pretty, again, many, many, um, there are many subtle issues there. Uh, authentication by itself is relatively straightforward. You, whatever you owe off, whatever LDAP, you can use it. But uh, when we get into enterprise, there are many different ways they want to do it. Sometimes they have one account for the entire company, and then sub-account for each department. Or each sub-department is different account, but they want to share something. <laughs> So, so instead of clearly, I just give you an account, you do your thing, you always have some different sets. So you want to find a way to accommodate that because authentic uh, security is most, most time it's a deal breaker. If you cannot do that, that's a deal breaker. Other things, scalability, performance, you can still tune in things. If you cannot support their account structure, then it's a deal breaker. Another thing is resource isolation. I don't know. I don't know if there are any security people here. I don't really know, but I know I would not be happy if my container is running in the same VM with another people's container. Although it sounds like I have all the root, whatever, I know it's not secure. So you you have to do the resource isolation between users. But uh, remember, going back to uh, the first problem, sometimes these two are different users from our standard point of view because they have two different accounts. But those are two accounts belong to the same company. And they say, that's OK. So that's another thing you have to consider. Resource sharing, that's kind of the, that's the point, right? You have two, two accounts, but they want to share something. And attack surface, right? Here, here's another really important thing is, we are going to allow user to run arbitrary code in our system. How do you make sure they're not going to do something that bring down your system? Right? That, that's a very obvious, like very, um, Dark question, right? You 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 want to you want to assume that all your users are really benign, just uh, doing their own thing, but who knows? 
we want to make sure whatever they run, because we don't have, we do not scan users. Nobody, I know, none of the cloud providers scan users' code. We don't know what they're doing, but we want to make sure they cannot break in your system. So that's what I say, the, the attack surface. On a high level, basically, means you cannot allow user to talk to you. It's not allowed. Never open any network port from user to you. It's always one way. You cannot allow that. That's an easy way. And then all the VPC things. Um, here's another thing related to the security, right? You want your users or, your, or the user's dependencies to be in their own VPCs network. And then you, you use a tunnel to go there instead of expose that as an open endpoint in the internet that anybody can access. So that's another uh, common practice that we uh, encourage our user to do. OK, if you're not tired of all these difficult questions, there are more. Uh, operation at a scale. It's, it's, that's maybe if, if some people has SRE background, maybe they will have some idea. I would just drop dead if I see this problem. It's really difficult. Service monitoring. Yeah, you have, uh, as I mentioned, we have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of machines, billions of requests coming in every day. And at night, the, the bad part, they also come at night, at 2 AM, 3 AM. How do you know that things are working? Uh, you, even the logs, how do you know it's working? Well, service monitoring, you have to have really good monitoring system, metrics can show up. The, my dream is always show up, have a metrics dashboard, everything is green, it's good. Never happened. Every, no, any, any other team that I've worked at has as good as this. Some are better than others, but that's kind of holy grail if you have that. Alerts management. I don't know if any of you have had page duty, alert call, these 2 AM calls. Yeah. Sometimes there's too, too many, you get caught like just with no reason back again, again, or nothing happens and then next day you go to work or then all hell break loose, right? How do you make sure these? Lifesight debugging, right? At 2 a.m. you get caught, get up, look at your screen. How do you know if this is a real alert or this is something, nothing happened, it's just a false alert? How, do you, how can you make it at 2 a.m. like 10 minutes, you know you can go back to sleep or you have to really look at some, oh shit, something happens. Right. Then there's continuous deployment. I don't know how, I don't know, again, just, I don't know if any of you are in the serverless, server, server side. No, not serverless, the server side, like, have deployed your features on your servers. How fast do you deploy? Any, any, any idea, any data points? I'm just curious. Too long. Too long, yeah. <laughs> too long. Anyone complain too short? No one? I complain too short, sometimes it's too okay. short. We're deploying just basically. Like a web app on 10 servers or 50,000? Yeah, 50,000. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's oh. that scale. scale. We, are, we, are the, we are scalability meetups. It's always scale. 50,000 machines like you're going to want to deploy. If too long, then it gets stale, things bad, go bad. Too, too fast, it's just not never get into a stable station. It's, it's always some, something is upgrading. You don't even know which build, because there was a huge, a few years back, there was a huge down, we called S1, S7, 1, S7, 0 bug or incident happening in one of the major cloud providers. What happened was there was a bug, someone fixed it. Then he, he think it's good, I fixed it. That fix was sitting in the Git repo for two months, never get deployed. By the time, it, then it hits the, the server, everything wiped out. Two months. He, he forget about it because you have this. Oh, this is easy fix. Fixed. Checked in. Code review. Test pass. Checking. I'm I'm done. Right. It's not deployed. The deploy gets stuck. 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 Two months not deployed. Another incident was same thing. Uh, you have one. There's server. The backend is not one server. There's not one component. There's still many many components. There still need to be compatibility issues. So we are careful. So we d upload upgrade the server side first, right? So the server can talk to the, to the bad, uh, the c can talk to the new client, the old client. But that checking never get deployed. So when we checking the, when we, the, when we get to real deployment, it becomes the new server suddenly needs to talk to the old client. Boom, things go down. We, 
or something like that. She, she knows better. Um, something like that. Again, deployment. Right. Last thing is uh, tracing. Right. Tracing is, um, is another difficult problem. When, you, when the user request comes in, it sometimes just disappears. Really, no, no kidding. You don't even know what, where it goes. Because your, your log, I didn't even mention log. Yeah, tracing logging is the same thing. That if you log too much, slow down your machine. If you don't log enough, whenever you need it, it did. it's not there. It's always like that, like Murphy's Law, right? OK. OK, finally, finally, it's the, you have to, after all these hard problems you solved, you have still have to think about your user. You, your users are not machines. They, they are human beings. They have feelings. You have to make sure that your, your platform's usability is good. We have milliseconds in billing. Again, that's difficult. Third party management is this, use, as I mentioned, users do not, not, for any real users, their functions do not just have single functions. They uh, also have lots of dependencies. They need to pack up all these dependencies and then upload. That's another problem we need to figure out because the packing up that part is frustrating. Many user complaints. Again, users are humans. They have feelings. If they are not happy, they are not com coming to our platform. How do you debug? Another gentleman just mentioned, things go bad, user is not serverless. Right? They don't have servers. They don't have anything. My code, I'm a best programmer, but my, my function doesn't work. How do I know what's going on? You have to find ways for the user to debug their own issues. I mean, Alibaba does. I, I'm not sure about like function compute itself. I mean, in general, definitely yes. Um, does that have maybe? Yeah, anyway, I I just zoom through this fast, and all these metrics tooling. So finally, it's the tooling. Right, we need good toolings for the user to feel good, to feel good that they can run their functions on the cloud, on the serverless platform. Okay, maybe I'm just maybe I will skip the demo. OK, finally, I think someone is very interested in Alibaba Cloud. We finally touched about what is about Alibaba Cloud. So Alibaba Cloud, global internet user distribution. Those are the, some of our data centers, not all of them. I missed a few, I think. So we have tons of uh, data centers in China, obviously. We have one in Dubai, one in Germany, one in UK. U US has two. Australia has one. Singapore, India, we have Indonesia. And some some other data centers. Did so, you the one in UK? UK, where in UK? Yeah. I don't I don't remember. It's c close to London, I think, but it's not in London. But it's. The US standards, everything was close to London. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are the data centers we have. Global data centers, but I missed a few. South America and Africa, I, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't. Just, just curious. Yeah, sure, I, but I, I don't know. I don't think we have one yet. Or do you want um, students or agents that want to get into the industry? Yeah. Um, and being an investor, uh, that kind of security topic, are you examining the security of your investment or um, ways to get around that whole shared virtualization problem? Sure, virtualize it. You mean like the go path? Uh, if a if a poorly written application allows fast vector and to come through in a safe and virtual environment, it could actually expose other uh, containers and or virtual machines in the same piece of hardware. Mm, mm, like if you mean the user's function, they can't. They are, they are our functions, the containers are isolated. They can only expose themselves. They cannot affect any other users' containers. That's the, the, the resource isolation we, we make sure that will not happen. I, I normally say you, you really have to kill yourself. I, we kind of hard to prevent. But we would never allow you to kill someone else. That's, that's kind of the philosophy. Is, is that said at like at VM level? Or that's said at VM level. level. VM, for now, it's VM level. But it will soon not be at VM level. It will be at 
hardware, OS, and the whole, whole thing. So the, the low-volume low customer is basically just eating up cost. For now, yes. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right. You're right on. That's why we want to change. Yeah. Exactly. That's why we want to change. Any other questions? OK. Here's just uh, some kind of show off our roadmap. This is the, what we've done in the past, what, two years? Yeah, two years. So we previewed in uh, April 2017, right, 2017. We come, started with two runtime. So do you know what does runtime mean in the, in the serverless world means? <coughs> so because you need to upload up, you, you know? Yes, exactly, exactly. So it's so it's not you cannot write any other language, and you cannot write a function in an arbitrary language because we need a specific engine to run your function. And most time, that func that engine is written in the same language as as your function language. But this will change soon. Oh, those are the data centers. Data centers. Again, our product goes from every, uh, covers everything, but the most important part is really make people happy. Yeah. We, we sell happiness. Yeah. Yeah. So if the network, if my uh, internet works, I'll show you the fun too. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to demo actually. That's the, that's the fun too. Oh, here, yeah. SQL. No, no SQL is uh, like the dy Dynamo type of uh, right, database. Like what? Uh, we call table server. In, that's a, all, all these are all Alibaba cloud services. It's called the table, table store. Oh, it's so the, the table yeah. store database service of Alibaba's system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if you go to Lambda, Lambda has their Dynamo, S3, yeah, SQS. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of equivalent to that. Right. Yeah. So we have. We created Java runtime <coughs> that I wrote personally, and the HTTP, yeah. it, HTTP trigger <coughs> is handling a billion requests per day now. Um, HTTP trigger, uh, HTTP trigger is a, a pretty unique feature we have. I think at least Lambda doesn't have that. That allow you to create a function and uh, expose an HTTP endpoint immediately, without going through. If any of you are familiar with AWS, you need to go through gate, uh, API Gateway on AWS. And VPC support is another big feature we, we spend a lot of time on and still improving. That allows user to access their services in a secure environment. The dependencies will be in their, in their own VPCs. So that's why we need VPC support. Means our, fun our function resources are going to have a tunnel to their VPC environment. It's not actually. It's not a really easy thing to do. We spend a lot of time on that, so that users, their endpoint, their other dependency endpoint will be in their personal uh, or account level VPCs, and we are sitting in another VPC. We need to tunnel through that and access that. Anyway, uh, NAS support again is what I personally wrote. I think it's very cool. And uh, finally, there's revision support. I call it revision because I I basically copy the Knative's word. Revision means you have uh, configuration, you have version, and we have version alias. That lady there wrote that part. Okay. <laughs> okay. Finally, the, here's the event-driven part. Right? I mentioned the service platform needs to be event-driven. So here's the all these events. We spend a lot of time on that. We have timer, SLS. SLS is the log uh, logging uh, debugging service, like CloudWatch. If any, again. Any of you are familiar with AWS CloudWatch, HTTP trigger, IoT, API Gateway, MNS is like SQS, S S SNS is a queue service that you can subscribe a topic, you can get uh, notification. So basically, uh, all these things, these are all event means anything happens. You register, you register to that service, say anything, say for example, if it's a MNS, right? If there's a t something published to this topic, send me an event come with all these topics, what's in that, then I can do something. So that's really the fundamental serverless uh, computing paradigm. Uh, then we will hit, we will, we will spin tons of millions of function computes, our containers in the back end, and then 
you can do all your things. Code, video conversation, conversion, file index, STL, social media, whatever, all these. Our, our users are pretty creative. They use it many, many different ways that you, you never imagined they can. They, they use it, all these things. They are very creative. Okay, so finally, demo time. I don't know if we still have time to do a demo. Is it? Go, go for it. Go for it, okay. So finally, here's the fun tool. So if you, any of you use Knative Kubernetes, they have Kuba control, right? Kuba whatever, I don't know how to call it. Kuba cuddle? Cuddle? I don't know. Kuba cuddle? Yeah. So it's kind of similar to that, so that you can have a templatized, uh, basically you have a YAML file, you have your fun tool, we just it called fun, you can do fun init, you can do fun local. So you need serverless, right? If the serv if your function is only run running on a server that you, you cannot reach, it would be difficult to deploy, uh, difficult to debug and uh, develop. So we give you a local environment, very similar to the remote one. So you pretty much can spend most of the time develop and debug locally. And then when you're done, you say deploy. Then voila, all the things are there. That's, that's what the fun tool is. One cl click deployment. So, and it's an open source one. Here, here's the link. If any of you are interested, you can play with it. Finally, let's see if I can do a demo. Okay. Okay, here, here. Oh, it's too small. Hold on, hold on. Is it, is it big enough? Yeah. Okay. -ish? Sort of, let me, that's better. Mm. From Twitch, can, <laughs> from a <laughs> Twitch, <laughs> how, how, how many, how many, again, I need to say hi, say hi to these Twitch guys, I haven't talked to them. How many of them are there now, three, four? 50 million. 50 million, great, 50 million, we're hi. We're making, uh, we're making yeah. how, how much was like ops to run a server? Oh, a lot, but a gazillion dollars to run a server. <laughs> <laughs> So here is our YAML file, right? It's, it's if, you're if you're familiar with the, or any of the YAML thing, Kubernetes thing, it's a little bit similar. Uh, and if you're familiar with the AWS ROS cloud formation, it's kind of along that line. So you can see we have a resource, we have type, it's a service. And we have a whole bunch of different languages. Those are the languages we have. Those are all, okay, let me just, just do an easy one. Fun deploy. Can, can you talk about the model? Yeah, sure. Okay, now it's, it's going to Hong Kong. <laughs> okay, good. It's deployed. And uh, let me see if my network works. So I'm going to log on to. Wait, where, where exactly did you just deploy? Uh, we deployed all the functions. All the functions? Yeah, so uh, let's see. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me see. Let's see. Uh, there are some, <laughs> these are the fun tools examples. Oh, okay. Oh, so you're, de you're deploying all the language stacks. Yeah. Plus some other stuff. Let me see if I can do it here. So I'm not really a script guy or, or so the only, among these five languages, like Python <coughs> 2.7 is the only thing I kind of literate. For others, I, I have no idea. So the example I used is, they have five of them. So the Python one is the only one that I'm a little bit, I can work with. So this is the handler. So if you give you a, can I make it big? No, I think, no, that, that, that doesn't work for some reason. What are other big like, languages you've seen in other countries? I'm sorry? Languages using another country? Yeah. We don't speak Python in China, so I, I'm not sure what the question <laughs> is. Everybody just uses JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, JavaScript, yeah. So this is Python, this is Python 2.7. So again, for someone who has never seen a, a serverless function, this is the, what I mentioned in the very, very beginning. That's the entry point for that function. Instead of saying main, right, it's, it's just Handle. You can call it. You can call it anyway, anything. All you need to say is let the server know what the, what's the name is. If you call it Angel's whatever home, 
it will you just say this is the entry point is this x. So we just make it easy to call handler. And because the official name is called handler, what's your handler's name? The handler name is handler, just like secure secure password is secure password. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do whatever. So th this is the entry point. You you, and actually I'll show you where this is defined in the. Somewhere here it's handler. See, so if you go down somewhere the Python, where's the where's the Python thing? Okay, yeah, right. The handler name is index dot handler. So. So, could, so it's called handler, but here it's designated handler. Can you just call it index dot whatever? Yeah, you can call it whatever. Then, okay. then, this will be whatever. So, so that would work. Cool. Yeah, as long as they match, they will know. Yeah, so that, that's the entry point. And this is, we're getting the request ID. Basically, we get all the HTTP things from headers, bodies, path, method, info, all these, right? So I just deployed it. But another thing is I think I can do this. Fun local start. So this starts all these things in the local environment. Let's see. Oh, so fast. OK. So that, that remember I mentioned that you want something that you can debug locally so that you can, you can run something. And uh, let me see, where's that Python thing here? Right. So this is the Python thing. It's a little bit difficult for me to look backward and uh, copy things. Maybe I have another, do I have another? Yeah, yeah, that, that GitHub, it's in the, that GitHub. This thing, right? I can curl it. Just like this. This, see, oh, maybe you cannot see. This is local host. Right, this is local host. I'm hitting the local endpoint. Let's see what I get. And in the meantime, see, this part start to run. In the, locally, we spin up a container, if you want to know what's going on. We, we spin up a container. You can see this is a container image. And uh, it says this is a request ID, maximum memory used, uh, billing duration. That's the code start. So the billing duration is 136 milliseconds. And on the other side, that's what we get. If you look back the code, the code basically is returning everything, right? Just one thing. I feel bold, so let me do a live demo. Live. Equal to two. Okay. So now I'm adding one more response in the body. Uh, let's see. Where is my? Okay. Let's see. Is is live here? Somewhere. Oh yeah, here. Yeah. So that's that's my I did I write something right, and uh, I since I deployed, let me this I really cannot do it backwards. Let me log in to my account. I need a chiropractic of this. Remote command injection? What, what does that? That's a nice little demo of what that is. So basically, you run a container, uh -huh. and you actually make it from the list of that container injection. Yeah, something like that. So the, OK, maybe I can see that even from here. I don't know. Can I? Maybe yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get. So the only thing is, I wish I could show you. Let me see. So I'm going to the console. Oh, I need to log in again. Hold on. That's not right. Ah. Ah. Sorry, I need to come back. It's not this one. 
So I'm logging on to the console. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to log on to the console, show you the thing that I just uploaded, and uh, show you that you can hit not the local host. You can hit a remote host. That's what I'm trying to do. Just need to figure out the. Okay. 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 I get what a lot of messages. Yeah. Okay. You see, I invoked it four times. Let's go back to this function. Okay. Here's the URL, right? Here's the URL. By the way, this is the same code. If oh, yeah. uh, same code, I can even demo it if I change this. But let's try to crawl that that guy. Right. Oh. Does it work? Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, just want show you that is really this code. Let's change this. Uh, change live demo re remote. Let's save. So this thing is basically you're uploading the code. This save is uploading code to the server. Now the server has the code. And uh, let me call again. Let's see. Does it have? No? Local authorhood oh, here, here, here. Yes, it is here. It, it's just hard to see. Live demo remote. So that's the. For now, it's an open, <laughs> open endpoint, but you don't have laptop. You can just hit it. You, everybody can curl it, see if it can break it down. But I guess you don't have enough laptops to hit it. Don't worry, I'm just sending out fifty thousand. Yeah, try, try. It, it will cost you a lot, actually. That's I know. I would deny off your wallet. That's the. Uh, okay, that's pretty. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Finally, let's jump back to where's my. Oh, okay. So if anyone is still interested, this is the GitHub. Um, can I share this at the end of the uh, the session? Like I can post this in the meetup. What do you mean? Oh, po yeah, post yeah. like the, the PPTs or the materials. Say you're sharing it right now. Do you guys yeah. ever deny users service? If you do not pay, maybe yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, we we have. That, that's another pain point, right? Remem remember I mentioned dependent. One of the dependent services is to check if the user is in debt. And once that service is down, our service is down. You, you think that that's, that's, but that's one of the things we are really dependent, hard dependence on, that check if the user is in debt. We have, uh, I think we have a compliance VP that he probably is a better person to answer that than, <laughs> right? We we pay them a lot, so he should know the know the question. But when you edited in the browser earlier, do you? Uh, I can go back to the browser. Changes, uh, like you make changes there, but you also have your local repository. Is it the same? No, no, it's not the same. It's so so remember this. It's probably not good practice to like actually edit in here. Yeah, it's probably not. It's good to. So okay, let me do this. If you want to really show, I, I edit my here, right? Live two, and then. You can edit. Th this is the edit, but you don't want to edit in the browser actually. Yeah, you, you actually do not. 
So do you want to edit in the browser or you do not want to edit in the browser? I don't want to do it in the browser. I feel like I don't have as much control. You don't like to edit in the browser, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's why you have this. This is the this is the VS Code IDE. So you do it here, you test it here, and then you do deploy. automatically pulling code for GitHub based on pushes, heads, and all that so that if you're cleaning your code to a source repository, that when it hits a release marker, it automatically goes to... So, so you mean there's a GitHub trigger that if there's... Right. Sometimes integrating with point uh, So far, I'm not aware of that. And I'm not aware of... Is, is there one in AWS? I don't yeah. yeah, I don't think AWS has that either. Okay, so now let's deploy that thing. So I just changed this to live real time. Real time. Then I'll just do fun deploy. OK, so now I'm deploying whatever I just mentioned there. It's called real time. So it's real time that it's Python 2.47, it will be in real time, right? So this deployed, now I'll go back to hit that endpoint again. So this is done. Let's try this. Right, I'll hit the same endpoint. Let's see if what does it get. Live real time. Right. Yeah, of course, every region is a different deployment. Yeah, this is in Hong Kong, somewhere in Hong Kong. Yeah. Somewhere in Hong Kong, if you can. Right, somewhere, where, what the hell? Hong Kong. And so this is the, where's the real line, real time, right? This is, so I deployed, I hit the a remote, remote uh, endpoint, and you can see that. So that's the idea, exactly that. You locally, you have your VS code, whatever IDs you like, you, you run, run it. You can also run it through your local host, right? There's, there was a local host. You run all these, you're happy with it, Fun deploy, deploy everything there. Your remote is the same as your local. So that's the, that's the basic. You actually make this demo a lot more convincing. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, the last thing I think is, oh, OK. My, my uh, marketing guy asked me to put this here. Um, we have a free trial. Anybody want to play with it? You have 300 free credits, so maybe Adrian, you can use that to hit our server. <laughs> oh, you can still use it, just use a different email. Actually, most of our users, especially heavy users, they don't use more than two regions. Okay. Most of them, they don't use more than, I don't know exactly why, but they don't use mo more than two regions. So, so, so far, it's not a problem. But uh, that too, we can improve. If you can you know, go, go there, raise an issue, say I want to push to multiple regions at once, it should be able to, it's, it's an e easy way to do it. Okay, that one. And finally, thank you very much. Thank you for your time here. Thank you, teacher.